Sophie has been working in transition movement for training people for 10 years and Dita is here also. Where are you, Dita, from? I, I'm not aware of. Can you introduce yourself and begin the uh, call from there? Thank you. I work on regeneration of soil and people and community, and uh, I'm a fan of healthy human cultures and education. <laughs> Lovely. Sophie, you can take forward this call. Lovely. Thanks, Mahi. So welcoming everyone. Um, welcome to, to be visible or not. Um, we're going to invite a little bit of interaction at the beginning. So if you feel OK to be visible for that, you don't need to turn your sound on. So I think you won't appear on the recording. Is that right, Mahi, that it'll just be the one speaking? But if it's all right to just do a bit of waving at each other, that would be very sweet. Um. I think the one who's speaking will be there on the recording. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So I'm um, just checking again that um, you're here expecting a session on um, healthy human culture, ways of reweaving and repairing um, culture. And yeah, I've, I've had a bit of an eclectic journey with this. I've played a lot of football. I was an engineer once upon a time. Um, I've done quite a lot of grassroots organizing in various places, including in the transition movement. Um, I was a therapist for a little while, but I've always really been interested in human systems and groups and our relationships. And, you know, this question, what is this being human? What does it mean? And how as human beings can we great healthy culture um, and, and how do we not do that? Seeing, I don't know if anyone else has had the experience where you're with a group of people and you really have a beautiful intention and things go really wrong. You know, you end up in difficult conflict or everyone gets exhausted and burnt out. Um, anyone else had that kind of situation where, you know, a group of really good people ends up in a, in a really difficult situation. So, um, if you feel to, it would be really lovely just to hear a few words from, from you and maybe we can just put them in the chat because the group's getting bigger and we've got a lot of things that we'd love to cover, including moving our bodies. So if you want to just say where you are in the chat and if there's a project you're involved in, or if there's something particular that's drawn you to this session, um, it'd be lovely just to see that if you feel to do that. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I would like to add something. Um, my name is Haidai and I work for the uh, Kingdom of Bali uh, in the village of Kung Kung. And Bali is one of the uh, last of the, I mean, one of the few uh, living culture where they have not, um, they, you know, they have not changed for a thousand years. They they've been doing what they've been doing uh, for for since the beginning. And part of my work is how do we regenerate this culture? So I'm very interested in some of the concern and some of the topic that you're addressing. Uh, so that way we can help the kingdom of this living culture regenerate more clearly uh, in a way that can be dynamic for the modern culture or for for any culture for that, that matter. So I'm very excited to, to hear and, and your sharing. Lovely, welcome, hi Di, and thanks. Some of you are putting things in chat, it's lovely to Feel our circle spanning across oceans and continents. Um, and yeah, I feel to just dedicate our session together and the intentions we bring to weaving this web of life that we're part of in, in better ways and in good ways. Um, may there be interesting healing and connections here. Um, and may it be of use to you in, in the good work that you're doing, whatever that is. Um, hopefully we'll have a chance to share a bit more as we go through. Right. So 
So um, we just wanted to do a little bit more sharing. Dieter, are you good to just invite a little game for us? Welcome, um, Dieter. Thank you, Sophie, and welcome, everyone. I, I've learned the importance of being welcomed and how, at least in my culture now, it's not so common. So I really want you to feel that you're welcome to this session. And as part of that, of feeling how we are here together, we want to um, offer a, a bit of a reflection of individual things that we do or have been or, or how we are. And uh, we call it step in everyone who, and the idea is that any of us can mention something that you do or that has happened to you or that you feel connected to. And if any, if you hear something that resonates with your own experience, you just wave a sign. And then I recommend that if, if you can have your gallery view, then you can see everybody that is resonating with what you're, what, what you have experienced. So uh, I'll just start, I, I'll just name a few, and then if, if you feel uh, called to, just uh, unmute yourself and, and share something. And again, if as a listener you resonate, you just wave your hands uh, so that we can share that. So I first... Or it could be you put a little reaction, couldn't it? Put a yes. thumbs up, that would be yes, fine. Yes, of yeah. course. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you, Sophie. It's so good to not do this by myself. Um, so... Every step in or wave everybody or sign uh, every everybody who have had an experience of learning where you felt really excited and enlivened by what you were receiving. How wonderful! And also, step show your hands. Uh, Everybody who have had the opposite, when you felt blocked and something actually prevented you from absorbing the learning that was being transmitted to you. Mm. And if there are any things that you're curious about others, just uh, you, you can, there's no obligation, it's just an invitation. I'm curious to see everybody whose first language is not English. And uh, with that, I would really like to invite us all to ask me, ask Sophie to slow down if we're going too fast, ask us questions in the chat, stop us. Um, I, yo también hablo español, un, I'm this in Deutsch. Um, así que podemos arreglar. I can, we can try to find ways of communicating uh, better. So thank you for that. So any more things that you're curious about other people? Step in if you wake up with the sunshine. I do. This is your chance to be a little bit nosy about each other, to be a bit curious. We'll just do a couple more. Step in all who are at least a little bit anxious. And those who live in the city. Wow. Step in if you heard a rooster this morning. That's lovely. Thanks, Dita. Thank you. Um, it'd be lovely just to notice a, a little bit about what supports us. So just inviting one or two words. What's supporting you right now? Supporting you to be here? Something that feels nourishing in your life? Just um, if you want to just say a word or two, and then again, if it's true for you, we'll just see that as well. Anyone want to just unmute and say a word? What's supporting you? What's nourishing you? Coffee. Anyone else? Being nourished by coffee, <laughs> not so uh, much. 
High dive. Yeah, yes, food, breath, uh, always is the highest, you know. Uh, but uh, the, the thing that is really nourishing me at this uh, conference is the, uh, it's just all the possibility and imagining what we, what we can do. I mean, and some of it is, yeah, you know, right. uh, is big, big hurdle, but it's lovely. Possibility, the possibility that comes when we meet each other. And I, I'm going to include in that a perhaps unreasonable faith in the universe. Thank you, Olga. Anyone else got a kind of some faith that the universe is going to figure it out to help us? It's beautiful. Dishes my sister has been cooking for me. Being in nature. Who else is supported? Lovely. And children. Who else has children here? Not obviously with you on this call, but yeah, blessings to the mothers and fathers. Thank you. The most important job in the world. Lovely. So um, I want it to be okay for people to share things that may feel quite personal. So if we're good to just make an agreement to not speak about what anyone else has shared outside of this circle, that would be really helpful. You're super welcome to share anything that I speak about and the models. We want this work to travel. Um, but otherwise, let's just keep confidentiality around things that um, other people share. Um, and yeah, we're going to invite you to do things with the body. So it's not a lot of us may be spending a lot of time on our computer screens, really encouraging that if you need to move away or take a break, um, we like to put self-care on top. So whatever you need to do to do that. And just to say, everything's an invitation. So, you know, if your body doesn't feel to move when I'm inviting you to move, please follow what your body needs first, really inviting us to put self-care and self-responsibility at the top. Um, great. So um, we're going to start off by doing a, um, a little embodied exploration about um, about pairs of archetypes. And the, the main intention for this session that Dieter and I are bringing is to share a kind of map that I've created from the many different um, areas of work that I've been involved with. So um, I, ho I hope you like maps. I, I really like them. And, and what I see is that having a good map of uh, some of the underlying things that organize human culture helps us to navigate our way. So when things are not going so well, this idea of the map might be something that's like, oh, what kind of thing's happening over here? And then can I use the map to help bring me back to a place which feels more constructive, more positive, more resourced? Um, and with that sense, you know, again, I don't know how it's been in your projects, but I've been in many, many projects where there was a, a fairly steady movement towards burnout and lots of people involved in good work got exhausted. Anyone else seen burnout prevalent? You know, I mean, in all kinds of places that's happening. And I think it's really, isn't it? We sometimes talk about the parallel across scale that the planet is burning out at one level. You know, the planet is overheating, but also what does it mean to be part of a culture that burns out? And especially if our work is intended to stop that burnout. So, you know, this question, how could we catch that? And how could we ask questions to bring ourselves back from burnout, from conflict, you know, sometimes a group is, is doing really great work and it just runs out of steam. We may not be exhausted, but somehow, you know, we've lost the enthusiasm. So, so we're going to share this little map. Dita, I'm going to ask if you can um, dig out the document to harvest the words from this embodiment exercise and just put a copy somewhere so that we can share that maybe. And um, we can also do it in the chat, so don't worry. So I'm going to put in the chat some pairs of archetypes. And <clears throat> I got really interested. And an archetype is like a quality, 
you know, some people see them as characters in stories, but they're kind of words or symbols or qualities that are really core to what's happening in a group or a culture. So I got really interested in these when I was working in transition because it seemed that the, that conflict that happened again and again was between people who wanted to do stuff and people who were more interested in how we do stuff. Again, that may feel really familiar. People interested in action and people interested in process. Anyone else found that? And often these two kind of energies would have a big argument or they'd be like, we don't have time for the process. We need to do things. Or, you know, if we just keep doing things, we're just going to do them in exactly the same way that we've been doing them for the last, you know, several hundred years in modernity. And we're going to end up with the same results if we don't ask deeper questions. So one of the pairs of archetypes that I'm going to invite us to explore might be doing and being, doing and being. And, you know, translate to whatever words uh, kind of work for you. Another might be action and stillness or action and rest. And I'm going to put another pair that I came across in, a, um, in my psychotherapy training. But I also um, came across it in a book by Martin Luther King. Um, so love and will, you know, love and will. But he wrote, his book is Love and Strength. And I think that's a really interesting pair as well. Love and Strength. Love and will. So I'm going to invite you, if you're up for it, to just choose one of those pairs of words and we're going to do a little embodied exploration of, of them together that I'm just going to guide. Does that make sense? So I think I'm going to do doing and being. That's what I'm going to speak to. But you might be, you know, action and stillness or strength and love. All right. Are we good to have a go? So you're welcome to be off screen. I'm going to invite us to stand up if you feel to. If you don't want to stand and move you can just do it with one hand or with your two hands so we're just going to explore things but i'm going to stand and then i invite you to as well i'm going to also take off a layer of clothes and let's just shake our bodies out so baby stretch if you've been on the screen for a while just see what does your body really need what does your body need Oh. And it might be that it's good to make a bit of sound or just do some out breaths, sighing or yawning, just letting go of any tension in your body. Oh. Welcome. We're just doing a little embodied practice with some pairs of words. Dita, if you can just copy the words for people, that'd be fab. So great to have help her. So we're just choosing one of these pairs of words. And we're gonna start with the word that's more action oriented. So it could be strength or will or action or doing. And I'm just gonna invite you to find a way of moving that word with your body, okay? So my word is doing. So if I ask my body to be doing, what does that look like? Today, this is what my body's doing. It changes every time I do this practice. So what's your action word? How does your body move or express that word? Just have a little play. And really encouraging you to experiment and, and be playful and curious. So I'm doing. And just notice how it feels to be doing. How does it feel? Welcome, if you're just joining us. We're just having a little embodied inquiry into a pair of words. So I'm um, just going to keep putting the words in the chat. 
just choose a pair of words and we're starting with the active word and we're just moving it in our bodies. So I'm doing, doing. What does it feel like to be with your word? What other words might you, might you describe? Um, and we're going to invite you to explore a distorted version of this word. So what happens when doing gets a bit unhealthy? And one way is to really exaggerate. So if you're moving, move more. If you're going fast, move faster. Still self-care on top. If there's a lot of energy, more energy. If there's a lot of power, more power. So we're really exaggerating it and then inviting you to just imagine that you keep doing this for a really long time. You do this all day. If you have a little break for lunch, you're going to do this all day. How would that feel? How does that feel? And we might ask, does life ever feel like this? Just doing, doing all day, keep going, keep going, a bit more, a bit more. Yeah. And let go of that. Just noticing how that might feel. And we're just going to do one more expl exploration with this word, which is to find the real essence. You know, if you found the perfect version of doing, how would your body move that? The perfect um, version of action. What would that be like? What would you... What would you do? And I notice I'm a little bit slower, smoother, but yours may be really different. Just find the perfect, the divine version of this word. What does that, what does that move like? And how does it feel? How does it feel? Okay. And then we're just going to do a little play, which is to stay with that word. So just coming back to an ordinary version of doing. And we're going to bring in a little bit of the other word. So now, can I be doing and being at the same time? And it might be one hand and the other hand. And it might be there's a different quality to your movement. Just playing, just playing. Doing and being, action and rest at the same time, love and strength at the same time. What does that move like? And we're going to swap right over to the more still word, to being, stillness, love. And just really letting your body find a shape or a movement for that shape or a movement for love or stillness or being. And again, just playing and experimenting. Experimenting and Let's see if we can really exaggerate this. So if you're slow, even slower. If you're inward, more inward. Whatever your qualities are, just really exaggerating them. If you're still, more still. And we might imagine again, what if you did this all day? And then you got up the next day and you did it again. All day, just this without changing, what would that be like? And does your life ever feel like this? Or has your life ever felt like this? How does it feel? And then we're just going to come back to an ordinary version of that ordinary kind of being or stillness 
And see if you can find the perfect form, the perfection of stillness, the perfection of being, of love, giving that expression with your body. What does that feel like? Right. And our last little play experiment, just going to invite again, moving back to, to both together. So I'm being, but I'm bringing in a bit of doing. I'm being and I'm bringing in a bit of doing. How are you getting on, Dita? You found a document. You're fantastic. Oh, there. Great, so doing and being, strength and love together. Really noticing how that feels for you. And again, does it feel familiar? Wonderful. Wonderful, so thank you for playing. Just find your way to bring that to a close, whatever you've been, been with. And we've got sharing rights for everyone on the document. Fantastic. So um, it would be really lovely if you're up for it, just to put a few words in this document. Um, because for me, this simple exercise starts to give us a map of human culture. Um, and I'll show you what I mean as we go through this session. So here, these blue ones at the top are the things to do with strength, will, action, doing. So here where it's fun or movement, I could write a word. You know, for me, that felt powerful when I was acting, uh, doing that one. The distortion, when we do it for a really long time, is on the right-hand side. The essence, the perfection, is on the left-hand side. Thanks, Perfect. Yeah, lovely. People putting words in. That's exactly right. Please start writing your words. This purple bit in the middle where it says flowing, that's when they're dancing together, moving them together. And then we've got the love, stillness, rest being. It's the green at the bottom. Again, ordinary, distorted the essence. So just um, taking a few minutes just to put a few words in there. Would you like so me to that? share my screen if for those who don't want to go to the document? Yeah, great idea. Thanks, teacher. And if you want to put things in chat, that's fine. Just say which which bit of the um, exploration it was. We can add them. Yeah, thanks, teacher. Oops. So if you've just joined, we've just been doing a little embodied exploration of pairs of archetypes of strength or will or action or doing a kind of active archetype. And thanks, Mahi, and a, and a stillness, love, being archetype. And we're just gathering how did it feel to explore those with, with our bodies through movement. So really grateful for those, you know, that had a go and... Lovely to see your words. Right. Let's take another minute or so. Lovely. 
I really love being just different words. Okay. Great, so we can see some of those in the shared screen. So just take a pause and just have a look. So over here on the left hand side, we can see um, how it feels when we're in a healthy version, in a really perfect version. We get um, confident, balanced, self-expression, calming, smooth for the strength and will and heartful, tender, connection, flow, powerful, regenerate for the stillness or the, the quieter archetype. And there's some lovely words in the middle. Um, and over on the right hand side, we can see the distortions, manic, oppressive, life sucking, confusing, pointless. Uh, and then for the quieter archetype, numb, bored, lethargic, confusing, uncertain, static. Lovely. And, it, and I'm always interested in this m place where they meet. Conf you know, it can be confusing, but also there's often aliveness. Mm -hmm. There's um, curiosity, balance, dance, you know, interaction, something interesting happens. So I'm going to make a proposition to you and I'm about to go into a presentation. And my proposition is that one way of looking at health is that these two archetypes are in balance and flowing in our lives. Both of them are flowing and they stay in relationship with each other. So a proposition of what health is for human beings, but also for cultures is these archetypes stay in balance, in flow, and in relationship. Right, Dita, do you want to stop sharing? Thanks so much. Um, and I just want to say some other archetypes. You know, I, I learned a lot from a woman called Sabonfu Some. Some of you may have met her, or Malajima Some, teachers from the Dagora people of Burkina Faso. And for them, health was fire and water in balance that elements of fire and water. And they said we need three times as much water as fire because fire is so powerful. And I once heard Maladoma say, fire is the element that is out of control in modern culture. Does that feel true? Fire, and for them, the distortion of fire is addictions and speed and, you know, literally burning things up. I thought it was a really interesting way of looking at what's happening in, in the modern world. Um, I'm curious about yin and yang. I don't know so much about Chinese medicine, but I've heard people who do know that system say the essence of health is the balance and relationship and flow between yin and yang. You know, that's the first definitional thing of health in Chinese medicine. So these are pairs of archetypes come up in different systems of thinking, which is why I got interested in them. Um, I'm going to find my presentation. Just while she does that, just inviting everyone to connect with whatever resources you may be in your body, with your breath, if that's something that you like or feel drawn to or with objects around you, with the light, the shapes. Lovely. Thanks, Dita. So Dita's encouraging us to make this flow. We've been in action and words and thinking, and she's inviting us to take a pause so we bring these qualities back into relationship as we move through this time. So yeah, really inviting one or two, just really gentle, slow breaths and let go of the screen and just, yeah, where are you? I get really excited when I share this work. So I have to be slowed down by my helpers. Thank you. Okay, are we good to move forward? Anybody need anything? Please put questions in the chat or just unmute and interrupt. Otherwise, I'm, I'll assume that we're good um, to go. Good morning. Uh, everybody, Hi, Sandy. 
Yeah, hi, Sophie. And um, so I'm coming from Canada and uh, what I call Turtle Island. And I just really want to be honest and uh, and also appreciate and share the gratitude. Uh, I these models that, that you're per, that you were presenting, we, 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 I find that it's just it keeps us locked in our brain. So words on one end and words, 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 words. So I'm curious if there is other ways of inviting other cultures with movement. And I, I realize that's what you're doing, but um, um, we have such a short period of time and I'm so curious, like Heyday was mentioning something about his culture. Are we gonna be able to explore other cultures that, of people in the group? Um, so my intention is just to share this map a little bit, you know, and it's more, it's more, there are words on it and I'm gonna speak. Um, and then that we can just talk about anything else that we want to talk about. Um, does that feel good? I feel like that's kind of what I was invited to offer to the conference. So I don't want to not do the thing that I was invited, but I really hear what you say, isn't it? You know, what are the structures? What are the ways of learning that keep us in the same patterns? Um, and I guess I was curious that I'd met, I met these archetypes in different places. You know, the dagger is not a written culture. And so it's not these the patterns don't just come from the West for me. Um, but yeah, really hearing that. Can I just share this map quickly and then we'll have more time for the next bit. Okay. Okay, and if you want to just tune out and just, you know, what's your answer to this question? Just take time to, you know, see what do you want to bring when we're sharing with each other a bit more. So I'm going to share my screen. Health of human culture. And I start with this. It's not the truth. It's just some ideas and a map. And if this isn't your way, just let it go. You know, let it go. And there's so many good things happening in this conference. So this is what we've been doing a bit with the archetypes. And part of what I got really curious about is whether these pairs of archetypes relate to our sympathetic and parasympathetic. So is there like a structure in the human body, the autonomous nervous system, that is organizing not just um, what we do, but also what we perceive. So most of our autonomous nervous system is actually receiving information and organizing it for us. So I got really curious whether these um, archetypes had something to do with our nervous systems. And that uh, we've done our embodied practice and that led me to this map and I, and I hope it's not just words, there are a lot of words and I'm sorry for that, if they don't work for you. But I hope there's something about the visuals as well that can give a kind of sense. So here's my proposition that in our health, you know, when we're moving about in the landscape, when we evolve to be human beings, this is how we would spend our time flowing between uh, action and rest and maybe a third thing which is lots and lots of social engagement lots of time playing gathering food together sitting around fires you know finding the water that we need getting the things of life but in relationship with each other and this ground state you know i'm curious in the modern world how many of of us ever really get to that, where we can be really relaxed in what we're doing and relaxed back into resting. And there's a very, very little stress in this way of living. Very little stress. And then this map um, just looks at what happens when there's more stress in the system. Here's a full emergency, sympathetic response, flight and fight. More and more people, um, I think, are getting aware of this, what happens in our bodies when, we're, uh, when we don't feel safe, when we feel threatened. How does this show up in learning environments? You know, what happens when children or adults don't feel safe? Their bodies might go into fight or flight. And when we're in these states, we are not receptive to new information. You know, we simply can't take in new ideas because all of all of our um, nervous system capacity is 
dealing with trying to get us to be safe again. And then we have these other nervous system responses that are more to do with the parasympathetic, which is the part of our nervous system that slows us down or soothes us, but it also um, totally puts the brake on. Some people talk about uh, the sympathetic as the accelerator, like the accelerator mobilizing, and the parasympathetic as what slows us and brakes, you know, with a like, like in the car. Horrible analogy. So all of this is what we evolved, how we evolved to deal with stress. A lot of the stress for, for being a social animal comes from being with each other. It's not, you know, a predator or even someone from another tribe. Most of our stress has to do with our belonging but to the culture that we're part of. How do I stay in right relationship with the people around me? Especially when I'm a child, when I'm young and I'm completely dependent on adults. But even as adults, you know, in the places where we became human and the places where we lived in harmony with the earth, we needed our tribe, we needed each other. So staying in relationship was really important. Um, and this is the bit that I got really interested in. If we've gone all the way to fight flight, if there's been some really difficult situation in a group, or there's been a threat from outside, a natural disaster or a predator, I mean, especially if we've gone all the way to freeze, we need some way of returning to this place of, rela of relaxation and ease. And we could say that over here on the left is also trust. Also trust over here. So for me, this is what healthy human culture looks like. A ground state with a lot of relaxation. There are threats, there are challenges. We need those. These are not bad things that are happening. This is just life. But we know how to come back. And often we need each other to bring us back. So I call these return paths. Um, and if we've got all the way to, to being frozen to something where we were really completely um, terrified, often we need to put each other back. So we might need a ceremony, we might need to be held while we discharge the stress. Yeah, so here's my map of healthy culture. And if we think about this in educational settings, you know, what might it look like? It might look like if there have been really difficult situations, um, then we take time to repair those. If there's been conflict, you know, how do we pay attention to what's needed to bring people back to a place of safety? But also part of this is about creating the conditions in which we're open and relaxed and feeling a sense of safety. And in that we might welcome both um, each other's strength, but also each other's vulnerability both the fire and the water, both action and stillness, and give time to both of those and, and show that both qualities are really valued as human beings and in the time, what we give time to. So I'm just going to do um, a kind of second bit of what goes wrong, um, and then we're going to have a little break and, and come back and, and hear each other more. So this is for me, it's like the big question is what happens when there are no return paths? And for me, um, this is what happened a lot with colonialism, that the people who held those return paths and the ceremonies and the places where return paths happened were often very consciously and deliberately destroyed, while a huge amount of shock was put into um, the peoples that were being colonized. And, you know, first it was done to, to the British in Britain by the Romans, but, you know, we did a very good job then of exporting it to many parts of the world. And there are other dynamics where this happens. You know, it, it could be that there is a natural disaster that wipes out many people, including the ceremony holders. Um, and I think in modern culture, you know, children are born now and they may have many challenging things that happen to them through their lives and there isn't time or space or understanding or what I would call social technologies to heal them. 
you know, how would it have been as a child if every time there was something really major that happened to you, the adults had called in space and time to heal that, to really pay attention to repairing it. So let's just take a little breath and a moment. Um, see somebody stretching, you know, that's a really lovely invitation. What does your body need right now? Letting go of words. And I, I am really in love with the practice of humming. Um, I invite us all to also feel your heart and the, resonate, the resonance of your body when you hum. Mm -hmm. Right, so just one or two more ideas. What happens after this failure of the return path? For me, this is what trauma is. It's not just a shock. It's not just an overwhelming event. It's an overwhelming event plus a failure of, of a return path. And this need for return paths for me means that trauma is always a landscape. It's never an individual issue. There's always a landscape in which a shock happens or a violence happens. But especially there's a landscape in which the repair doesn't happen. Does that make sense? So um, a lot of people are using the word trauma in many different ways. But, but for me, this is the most helpful way of speaking about it um, is, yeah, not just the overwhelming event, but and then nobody brought me back. No one brought us back. What does that leave me feeling that life has failed me, that I'm not safe? that my people don't know how to manage our pain. We don't know how to deal with difficult situations. So we're in some kind of survival mode. <clears throat> so here then we might end up with a culture where there's a lot of fight and flight, a lot of freeze and fawn that hasn't been discharged, that's still walking around in people's bodies, moving in people's bodies. And over time, um, the kind of things, the kind of behaviours that come from having flight and fight and freeze and fawn walking around in people's bodies and in their mental states will come to look like it's just what culture is. It'll come to be so normalised um, that it'll look like regular culture. And here are some of the things, you know, if, if there's a lot of flight, we might see a lot of avoidance or distracting, denying, manic action. So manic action that's not grounded in love and presence. Fighting, we might see bullying, control, aggression. Fawn is the response where we try to please others. So I give away what I need instead of holding my good boundaries. I just do whatever I think others want from me. And freeze where we literally can't move or do anything. Stay numb, don't feel anything, don't respond. And I think it's interesting to think if, if there's a culture where there are different people who have different survival strategies to cope after this has happened and culturally, we're trying to invent stories or make meaning out of what's happened and how things are. It will be the ones in flight and fight that really have the energy to write the books or to give the talks or to be in charge or to be the political leaders um, and people that are more in these submissive or um, less active physiological states are less likely to be the ones that are running things and the ones that tell the stories that explain what reality is. So we're gonna see a lot of reality framed by flight and fight. And I think we can see that certainly in my country in the UK, you can certainly see that in a lot of our media and stories and films, how fear-based so much of our media is. Um, and of course, for those with power and privilege, 
um, often there on this top right part of the map. Avoiding feeling the pain, avoiding feeling helpless, avoiding having to please others. Um, so now we've got a powerful group of people who carry on framing things, describing what's happening to suit them and to preserve their privilege. Okay. There's still health in the system and we can still build and um, and increase that amount of health. So for me, this is kind of, um, let's not get into that. Let's leave that one. But yeah, this is the kind of the map that I offer. And I'm just curious how that lands with people. So Anybody just got any questions that you want to ask? Anything that wasn't clear or that? Because it would be lovely to hear from hear from others or yeah, maybe to have a bit of time to speak with one other person and just see if this feels useful to you. If you're just coming in, I'm afraid you've just missed the presentation. So I don't know how you'll make sense of what we're doing, but. You're welcome to stay if you feel to. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, Mutani. I wanted to say thank you so much for that map that you've drawn out for us. For me, while listening to you, it was like you said, what you wanted the map to do, help us navigate. So there's a lot of things that I'm internalizing from the stories of had to the stories of written myself and stories I've heard from my people and about my people and even people who are supposedly not uh, mine you know I'm sorry I'm not loud enough sorry you're, you're fine my hearing's not great but this just helps me but you're doing great thanks Matoni okay okay so thank you so much for laying out the 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 map the way you have it's really helping me as we go and internalize a lot of things that uh, are happening right now for me and for and around me. And I think your intention for having the map out was very much met by the experience that I've gone through. And something that you said at the end of it that stood out to me is that the, the narrators are trying to preserve their privilege. And I'll I want to keep sitting with that as we go on. I just wanted to say thank you though so far. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matoni. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how it would be to just go into small groups and just hear each other, to meet each other a little bit more and um, have a bit of time. And it may be that, you know, either you've just come in and you can just hear what people say, you know, and you may have other questions and other things to share about healthy human culture, and then we can come back for the second part and just hear each other a little bit more. Um, Thank you. <laughs> welcome, Sierra. We're about halfway through um, this session. We just shared, shared a map. People have been in little breakout rooms talking about it. Um, so yeah, anyone who's back, It'd be really lovely to hear any reflections. Yeah, uh, yourself, Sophie. Oh, sorry. Yeah, welcome. Anyone who's back that might want to share some reflections, um, either put them in chat, but it'd be really lovely to hear more voices. If anyone feels to share a little bit. And then, yeah, we have these three questions. Uh, well, two questions, you know, uh, how does this, do you see any aspects of your journey with education in this map, you know, where there's been health, how was it in your body, how was it in your nervous system, what were you creating if you were teaching others, how did you create that balance and flow, you know, did, did that feel like something you were doing between action and stillness? you know, between how do we create a balance between different energies in the classroom or in a learning environment? 
And then, you know, have you been in environments where it feels like it's more on the right hand side where people are in activated nervous systems? So there's a quality of distrust, not feeling held or safe. You know, has that been part of your experience? And I'm really curious because this question, how do we make return paths? You know, if, you know, a classic example, if there's a culture of bullying in schools, or if there's a, a culture of fear, you know, how, how can we change that? And what happens when we try to change that? And I feel especially curious because often we can try to make a change at a small level of scale within, a, you know, myself, within my relationships, within a group, a learning journey. But if the wider context of a school or a university or, a you know, a teaching organisation is run by people that are on the right hand side that are aggressive or bullying or there's a feeling of scarcity all the time you know what do we do with that because that's the situation that i think many of us are in um so yeah really interested to hear your reflections yeah we have we have quite a bit of time so i'm going to stop talking and invite any there's a question in the chat from king jai sorry if i'm pronouncing your name not Properly. Yeah, how, do, how do we stop these responses when when they don't serve us and have just become a habit? Fantastic question. So I'm not gonna let's keep gathering questions and you know inviting us to answer each other's questions. Or you know, has anybody managed to do that? You know, someone else was sharing, yeah, you know, I've moved to a new place, but I've still got the habits of the old place with me. How do we interrupt those habits? Have you managed to do that, anybody? Um, I can I can share a little bit. Hi, everyone. My name's Abby. Um, I'm calling in from um, uh, North America, Canada, Turtle Island. And um, so um, really, thank you for sharing that model. And um, it wasn't um, it wasn't anything new for me. And I also really liked the way it was presented visually. That was very useful. And I, I love that idea of a path back and that visual. That was really, that was really useful. And I guess for me, just hearing that word, and I, I talked a little bit about this in our small group, um, just hearing that word um, ceremony was very powerful. And um, really, really exploring what ceremonies we can do in collect as a collective and um in a way that we're we're kind of tapping into our own indigeneity and and you know i'm coming from a north american context where um you know i i'm very mindful of of not co-opting the indigenous cultures here um and yet being in the same land with the same plants that are medicines and heal and, and healing and and um, also not being at all in touch with um, my mishmash of, you know, Northern European roots that are <laughs> scattered in bits of French and German and, and, and British Isles. And, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, something that is, um, I've, I've, restorative justice is something that has really just taken hold of me and, and I, it really deeply speaks to me. And um, so that's that's a framework that I use as a container to help um, to help me learn to be differently with people as a collective. And um, and yet I, I feel like I'm so starved for ritual and I'm so starved for ceremony and that's that's meaningful and not part of the dominant culture that we've we've all just um, been entrenched in for for so many hundreds of years. And so, yeah, I'm just really interested to hear any thoughts on on ceremony that that is that is coming from that um, the that deep place, and and then you know how to kind of we discover our own wildness, and um, and maybe what served our ancestors hundreds of years ago that we've lost. Yeah. So those are some of the questions that I'm sitting with. Thanks. Lovely, and just catching some of your words. Yeah, yeah, I'm really encouraging others to share, you know, either questions, but, you know, if you have some answers to this. Um, 
I, I, I got really interested in whether ritual is, is, is like an analogy for the gut bacteria. You know, I, I was in a conversation with someone who's a real expert on gut bacteria. It's like ritual is what helps us digest our experience. Is that true? You know, is that a return path already just to have a place where we even even to sit and tell the stories of the day instead of watching television? You know, would that be a ritual? Hi, Di, I'd love it. I, I love your question. And please come in and speak as well as adding beautiful words in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I apologize for the gambling, but I'm, all, I'm also at a, uh, a ceremony practice uh, where they're pre preparing to do a ritual, to do a performance uh, ceremony uh, for for the divine. And, and the whole objective is not to entertain anybody, but to connect to their highest their highest uh, divinity and the highest belief, their highest aspiration. And so, yeah, I think the ceremony and the ritual is that type of reflection. And, and, and when you have a collective uh, reflection uh, with intentions and purpose, and I, I can't say enough, and I'm gonna I'm gonna post on here this uh, information sheet that we put together for this calendar, and what what that calendar can be used for uh, for rituals and ceremony, and when to do it, and 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 what to do it for, because there, you know, science begin just beginning to explain that this emptiness that we call air or space is this frequency and vibration. And, and, you know, just like Wi-Fi, you know, which is very human and made, there's a, a larger electromagnetic force that is based uh, on the sun and the moon. And, and, and we, we, you know, we know what the sun and the moon can do for our bodies and, and you know, uh, all aspects of emotion. But... Uh, and and it's not just something like I said. I, I I actually when I came into this research, I was a little bit you know uh, worried that I would get trapped as a researcher into this pseudoscience kind of understanding, you know, of, of a calendar and and an energetic. But it, it's not astrology as much as they've been following this cycle for over thousands of years, and and, and these are behavior based on the, these high priests like there's 500 around 500 high priests in bali that uses this calendar so they're like to me they're like action researchers you know they they use it for for ceremony and so this energetic calendar that you can use as a framework to action research these behavior this energy and then be able to collectively connect into it uh, from a ceremony or ritual or like I said, just reflection. Like, okay, you know, if, we, if we're going to do a reflection today or right now, based on the hour, based on the day, I can tell you what's in the air. What, what is the energy? So how do we collectively tune into it and use that energy to know that we're being supported by something bigger than us even, you know? Um, so there's no fighting where who needs to be whose whose energy is the highest there's a bigger energy than all of us you know so i you know i, th I think this is you know you guys are tapping on something that uh i you know i think that the modern world and I, you know i'm a hybrid of that modern world because i grew up in silicon valley i came out of the original javasoft team you know i'm a technologist you know from silicon valley and i've been in bali for the last 15 years uh, and, you know, studying their cosmology and became one of their priests uh, uh, based on the calendar. So I see both sides and I see that starvation that we have in the West that that keeps us fragmented. And, and, and these systems, I don't think they mean to keep us fragmented. They just don't know a better way. And they follow a system that push monetary base, more of a linear you know, top down power given. And so scarcity is natural, you know. Scarcity um, yeah. is natural. And, I, and I think that's one thing I got from this whole um, conference up to and from yesterday and today is that we need to integrate. We need to integrate it. it. You know, we need to see that it's not them versus us, but we must see that 
we're not like to me i don't feel like we're just imagining a whole new world but we're imagining ways to to hospice them along and and, and caretake us further you know this david walls uh, uh one of his favorite lines is you know or i forget who uh, but uh yeah so that's that's my feedback to to what you guys are sharing thank you so much yeah yeah, I'll, I'll give you a quick peek. I'll turn my camera and give you, this is this is what they're practiced uh, for ceremony. One second. Let's see if I can. Where's the background? Let me turn up the background. Okay, one second. Oh, wow, look at that. It's happening right there. Thanks, I do look like it froze, but um, how beautiful to see that. And and what I hear is how much that is rooted in place and many generations, you know, have these things have been, you know, like you said at the beginning, things that are still living cultures that have been worked out over hundreds and maybe thousands of years, still, still alive. Like how do we live as human beings in good ways? Fantastic. Yeah, it, it, it's so, so beautiful. And, and then, you know, they're not performing for a performance. They're going to be performing for, a, for yeah. just themselves to, to the divine. Yeah. You know, and these are hours. I'm talking about, you know, uh, you know, dozens of hours in practice and dedication for yeah. something that, you know, is higher than them. But more than that is, is how they connect to each other in that process. And that's where that that power beyond words can say, you know, we can sit here and 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 say beautiful things, and we can all say the most beautiful thing that we all hear is still it's only at a at a mental state. These these are embodiment of frequencies and vibration and energetic based on the higher. Like I said, it's, it's a thank you. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear other voices as well, you know, and maybe come back in. But yeah, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing with us. And yeah, so isn't it so precious where there are still these ceremonies and people that are carrying them. And I love that comparison, you know, that what, what was art before it became a commodity? You know, isn't it? Art was nothing to do with something to be consumed or to be bought and sold. It was about the sacred. It was about honoring life, um, keeping us in good relationship. Is that true? Yeah. So I'm really interested in this, um, you know, this this thread that is is being woven around ceremony and, you know, restorative justice that I think is, isn't it, has come out of, sitting in circle and ceremonial spaces and, and council, sitting in council, but acknowledging that conflict and pain and suffering, it's never an individual issue. So we have to look at the whole system. We have to see it as a sign that the system is not working in some way. Uh, one of the things that Dieter and I do is we hold grief ceremonies, you know, and I think one of the organizing um, characteristics of a culture is, is the question, what do we do with our pain? What do we do with our pain? You know, do we make it into something beautiful in a ceremony and give space to hear it and tend each other and know that our, our pain is not separate from our love and our fear is not separate from our courage? You know, and our outrage, our rage is not separate from our passion for rightness and protection. Now, how do we see that? And, and when we make space for grief together, you know, like restorative circles, actually, 
there's something, some way that it really weaves us back together. But I'd love to hear others, any anyone else, you know, how, how have we made, I, I bet there's people here that have done beautiful things of making learning spaces where people felt safe or repairing SNP. For me, it's not about getting things right. It's not about making a perfect culture. It's about knowing how to repair, knowing how to bring each other back. It's about practicing saying sorry, practicing saying, you know, whatever it is, let's go towards what feels difficult and, and painful. Let's not leave it outside. Is that what you were saying, you know, for the, let's include the shadow, let's give it a place, let's include what's painful. I'm going to stop talking again. And anyone, especially if you've not spoken or if you've not spoken for a while, it'd be lovely to hear any reflections, you know, how, how is it where you are, what you've been doing or thinking about. Pardon me. I just want to express my gratitude. You've woven so many threads that have really created this beautiful tapestry, especially, you know, the central question for me um, as an educator, as a grandmother, as a parent, as a being is who can I be with you? And, and this is, um, this is what we're here to um to be practicing thank you i look forward to continuing the conversation i'm i'm part of um organizing a global festival of storytelling and you're framing fire this way we've been using this as an image and now it, it's gotten a much deeper um more possibilities have been revealed so thank you I'll follow up. Thank you. Great. Please be in touch. Yeah, thanks. Lisa. Yeah. Yeah, and I per personally, I would be really curious to hear if anybody has had experiences in bringing ceremony to learning environments, to teaching, um, and how that works. And um, I have the sense that sometimes we, we in, in I in in the place where I am, where it's so embedded in modernity, there's a lot of um, fear, perhaps, or rejection to bring in things that that might feel risky. I don't know why, because ceremony can be so soothing and making the space safe. So I'm really curious if any of you have tried, have had experience learning or or bringing that to to other people. Or any other way of, of bringing safety and, and connection. Judith, did you want to share something? Yeah, I think um a lot of the words that we use in academia are very wounding to start with so i think i do welcome uh, you know the word ceremony i think that's that's so inviting and yet uh, when it comes to our students the focus is on attendance retention and yet so i always in my mind, I try to kind of, um, okay, the, this, the, the student may be not here attending, you know, in, in our notion of attendance. Um, but when I'm with them, am I there? Or is, just, is it just my intellect that is with them? And, you know, based on what Hadai was saying, that creates a different energy. You know, like, 
And then when they ask questions, I should have answers. And yet, and if I don't give them the answers, they panic. You know, like, you know, let, let's just be with the question. You know, just kind of let's, let's come down and just be with the questions. But they are so trained to, you know, we must know the answer. We must, you know, they, 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 they don't know how to be different and just be open to the possibility of opening the inquiry and the answer is not the answer. So I like this idea of just, even in these spaces now, you know, just to practice this kind of just be in the space, in the moment and just wait. I may have some, a lot of intellectual questions, but then, you know, they can just take the back seat or stay in the shadow for a little bit and allow my whole body. And I, I appreciate, I think it was a, a Lebanese quote when you, um, or a, a greeting or something I read so, in some article where it says, when you asked, uh, how are you? The, the response is something like, I am moving well. You know, I so I I feel like, and that is so true. And I think in, in neuro, neuroscience they've established this: if we move together with just the same motion, our nervous system kind of calibrates across everyone else, and that is just so beautiful. I think I just want that. So I think, yeah, if we could take students walking <laughs> whilst teaching, I think that will just allow us to move well, you know, and, and generate different energies that uh, Haida was talking about. So I wish I could do that. I, I am imagining that I could move, you know, like move instead of just talk and just, because when I talk and all of us now sit on in front of screens, so I welcome, you know, this moment to kind of take care of yourself and move literally. Because your breathing changes, you know, even just putting up your hands up or down like this. It's just, it's just different energy, isn't it? So I, li I like that. So maybe I'll go to class doing this <laughs> and be a bird. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I... It's so interesting, isn't it, how in modern culture, I just know what word to call it, we kind of have to find reasons for these things that our bodies kind of know, isn't it? But, but neuroscience is so helpful now that we can talk about activation and we can talk about self-regulation. You know, we've had to have this whole new word to learn what, you know, human beings have known from the beginning, which is, yeah, we need to come into connection with each other and our bodies are a really good way to do that and how different that would be you know I think of other contexts that I visited or you know like where high die is or you know, where there's still a kind of understanding of the importance of love and connection and the body and how in modernity it's all in the head crazy crazy yeah Anyone else like to share any stories or questions, no examples, or just, you know, how this session has been for you? Anything that's felt interesting or not, you know, where there's a, hmm, I don't, that's not helpful. You know, and acknowledging that we're learning through this screen and through maps and models, isn't it? Like, I know that they're very kind of, I'm an engineer originally, and I'm, I, I, it's a bit of how my brain was taught to work. Yeah, but it'd be lovely to hear more voices if anyone wants to share something. Well, just um, really this reimagining theme um, and, and um, the work I do is, is um, inviting uh, school communities into uh, qualitative research conversations and um, storytelling also, but very much um, 
what happens in that is um, a lot of multi-contextuality gets revealed and um, understanding um, how, uh, how our education experiences have been um, limiting, I think. Uh, and so this question of, uh, I've really been coming around and around again to what is education for and what is education for now? And coming back to the words, my background was uh, in English as a new language and second language acquisition and really understanding um, different ways of how languages are created, how many, how much reliance on verbs versus nouns there is. Um, so this deep dive on language, because language is a tool. And I think we're at, um, we're at a space and time now where it, there's a big update happening and it's tending toward um, a less um, loving aspect. You know, when we were talking about love and ritual, how abundant that feels. And um, technology ha is bringing us together and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, we can conquer space and, and time. And at the same time, um, are we using it in ways that bring us together? Because ultimately, you know, we don't get past, many of us self-select out of higher math because we think we have to get good grades so we don't go beyond all algebra. And we don't really embody what it is to be fractal or algorithmic. And, and we are living in algorithms now, we're being driven by them. And yet, you know, if I'm teaching outside, there's a butterfly and its wing is fractal. And look at it on a microscope and the, you know, the zooming in and zooming out. It's just very humorous to me that here we are on Zoom and, and Zoom has become such a big word. So it's, it's the lens of culture and time and space. It, this time has been lovely with you. Thank you so much. And, um, I'll look forward to gathering and sharing more stories. Um, I would also like to share something because uh, just yesterday on one of the panels I was host, uh, Shane was saying that uh, when we switch off all our videos and see how much energy we are saving, you know, and uh, we we are having all that conversation that this is an you know a Zoom call we are having a conference on a Zoom call, but let's just say that like for uh, in three sixty five days in the year you don't like we watch so many things we watch so many movies and so this and that so why not create such a space just for two hours you know this is two hours this this session was two hours long. And in this space, we are from so different, you know, communities and regions in the world. And when we're sh sharing all these things, it, it, it is really good. So we cannot like neglect the fact that what like, you know, Zoom is bad, or technology is bad, this is bad or that is bad. We just like have to be a bit mindful of how we are creating that. Like, uh, you know, 15 days ago, I was in uh, Central India with tribals uh, there and uh, I was still seeing what things they were doing so we, we were in a gathering so let's say uh, so the blacksmith there's this community of blacksmith that does very beautiful like you know figures they create dancing figures of tribal people by stamp you know stamping all that so he said like one of my participants said like how do i do it too so he said that you need a rhythm to do that you cannot do that because i will hammer this uh, with the rate that my uh, the rate that matches my pulse rate and you cannot do that so i've done that for 30 long years and for having that you know rhythm with the pulse rate and all that was just hearing that was just so beautiful to me and i feel that even though i cannot like i was only able to get that information while i was there i felt that this was something that needed to be shared in some form of poetry to you know some other corner of the world because my other pa participants they were like you know when when we were at the potter's place so pottery is just not that you do with the wheel you know you also like you know hammer it just to make that round 
big pot that you see. So that's also involved in the process. And I, for some reason, never saw that. And when I went there and he was hammering and again, my, one of my fellow participants was asking a lot of questions. So how do I do that? Like, uh, you know, where, where should I hammer first? It's breaking. So at the end of the day, whenever we used to return from the potter's place, we would say that we broke five pots today. And all other people were like very surprised. Like, you know, we go to, you know, some other activity and they people come keep coming and saying that we broke five pots. So nobody was getting like what we were learning there. Like, you know, what are you talking about? How, how can you break a soft clay and the technique of doing is not something that any professor can you know teach you in any university even if you're there and that person cannot teach you like how to really do that or how to hammer that you just have to be there in that process to understand that this is how it happens you have to observe that and you you will eventually break 10 pots i broke five pots and still i am not able to learn but one thing that i understood from that is that it's a process like that person is doing that for 30 long years i might be able to do it you know after bringing 50 points let's say and local people and culture is what i feel that connects us and if we are you know having this opportunity if we have this opportunity to share this uh, into our conversation then i think you know a lot of things would emerge out of this yeah Thank you, Mahi. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Anyone else want to share a story, a, a reflection? And then we'll find a way. Welcome, Pooja. Isn't it weird? We can share the map and the some of the questions. So we'll share the document with you if you want something to take away. But um, yeah. Anyone else? Sierra, Tony, Mean, anyone? Nina? Anything you'd like to share with us? Ankita, please come in. Otherwise, I, I, you're going to get more of my voice. I, I'll just say that. Um, Thanks. I, I really appreciated uh, this talk, this whole experience, and um, just the talk about uh, ceremony and these kind of like paths back. Um, everything that was said about that has been extremely nourishing. Um, and I guess the, the feeling that I'm having, and I'm in New York City, which is maybe a difficult place to do this, but is that, you, you know, you, you because the dominant culture is like loud and forceful. Um, I feel like you kind of have to rescue people from the flow. In a way you have to like catch them. Uh, and, and that's something that I, I struggle with a little bit is like knowing how, how to kind of like create a routine um, or a practice with others around these things. So that's just a kind of open, question i guess hi everyone um if I, I would like to share as well an experience that goes um into into the the, the ceremonial type of uh, um actions to learn and uh once I was uh, I was doing uh, this kind of ritual with uh, with uh, some other women, and uh, we, it was a ritual to connect to to a baobab tree, a very one of the big big trees we have here in Senegal, and uh, to connect to the baobab. We were all very much into into our in intellect, and the person that was guiding us, she said. You have to feel there's two doors before you can access, two spiritual doors before you can access the Baobab. And you have to ask, request if you can access it. And so we went to the first door and we asked if we could access it in the internal intention. Then we accessed the second door. And uh, when we arrived to the second door, I, I, I started like leaving the mind out and I started getting this warm feeling in my body, which I could not explain. And at one point, the woman came to me and she said, Karina, open up your basin. 
the lower part of my body. And uh, intellectually, I could not understand what she was saying to me. Uh, but then suddenly, my body reacted without my mind knowing what was going on. And suddenly, I heard and I felt my bones on uh, the uh, on the you know the upper part of uh, uh, just above the 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 the, the bottom just they went clack clack and I could hear actually the bones go clack clack and I opening and it was such an amazing experience because I realized that sometimes words can also someone uh, earlier on said words are tools and sometimes words can encompass and go beyond I get the impression of the intellectual thinking and initial understanding and the body understands them so much quicker than the mind does. And the body just reacted directly. And I felt this opening in my body like poof. And then suddenly after that, I could cross the second door and I could go to the tree. And I felt this connection in a way that I never felt before. And, uh, and that's when I realized that our body is also we can learn through the body, we can learn through the action. And it's something I kind of like experienced before because I sing and the, the voice, when you think about wanting to reach a certain note and you think about it intellectually, it won't do it. Often it will block because you're putting too much pressure mentally on what you want to do. And it's only when you let go and you don't think about it that you're able to reach a certain frequency. And uh, yeah, that's, just uh, an experience I wanted to share with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So interesting, isn't it? Like I'm really sitting with this, you know, the modern world. And, and I've been in places where um, in one of the transition conferences at the beginning, I just asked, invited 300 people, you know, just close your eyes and take a breath and come into the present moment. And we had somebody later kind of write an email saying transition is a cult. You know, they're making us do really weird things at their conferences. You know, I've, I've had people who say, why are we sitting in circle? Why aren't we sitting around a square table? Like that the kind of, I mean, this is a long time ago, but I think that sense of there's something scary about it. It's not familiar. I have to stay in my comfort zone. I'm curious about that. You know, the word fragility, it's like, uh, what do I need in order to feel okay? And, and where that sits on the map, how much I think that sits on the top right, you know, that if I'm not having things control the way that I need them and the way that I'm used to, it's very, very frightening. What are we frightened of up there? You know, there's that part is in me. All of this map is in all of us. What am I frightened of? I think I'm frightened that if it all broke down, I would touch that trauma, those places of overwhelming experiences that we couldn't recover from, and I would get lost and I would never come back. So there's something about we need to build the left-hand side. We need to build our sense of safety and trust and do small things where we're meeting that fear. Isn't it? And, and I'm really curious how we can use the mind to go beyond the mind, you know, that if we're all about learning, how do we invite a question before we start the learning to say, how do we learn? And, you know, what do we learn through the body? What do we learn through words and concept? And, and kind of use the frame that we're in. If we're all about change, how do we go beyond our comfort zone? Isn't it? If we're all about learning, what do we need to learn about learning before we learn? You know, and open. Can we use the frame of the of what we're in to help us to kind of widen the doorway and go through some of these other doors, like you're saying, Karina? You know, what doors might we want to go through before we before we learn? You know, before we start the learning. So uh, we we need to stop in in a moment. Thanks so much, Dita, for your help. Um, thank you, everyone who's come. If you want to put a word in the chat. Um, it'd be lovely just to hear anything that you're taking from this or a word of how you're feeling in your body and yourself right now. Um, and yeah, may there be good ceremonies and good walks together as we're 
holding each other in this life. You know, I love that. Uh, I can't remember. Who was it? Megan, what you said. We need places where we stop together and we, to, you know, if we're going to change a system, we need to stop and feel and really intentionally do something different. And I'm really with that about how does change happen. So anyway, my last words, super grateful. If you want to do more healthy human culture things, look us up. Please take the um, that sheet that we prepared. And if you want to yeah, follow up with anything, I'm really interested to hear from anybody. So wish you sweet journeys and rivers and tapestries weaving through this conference. May there be many nourishing meetings. Thank you all. I also want to remind everyone that we've touched with things that might be also a bit tender. I feel quite tender and reminding myself and everyone to just make some time to lovingly take care of yourself. Maybe if it's even if it's just a few minutes. Thank you so much for being here and for all you do and are.